Um, just uh, by way of a very quick introduction, my name is Kim Hellmans. My pronouns are she and her, as you can see on the screen. And uh, I will be moderating today's conversation. I am a faculty member in the Department of Neuroscience. Uh, so I'm a, a colleague of Melissa's, uh, Dr. G. Uh, and I'm also an Associate Dean uh, in the Faculty of Science. Uh, and I'm also somebody who loves food. I mean, I'm sure we're all here because we're uh, to some extent interested in food and uh, all intrigued to know more about uh, the research program that, uh, and the, the studies that Melissa is going to talk about today. So I will take a moment just to do a brief introduction. Uh, uh, Dr. Chi's bio is on the website, but uh, I'll just give you a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Uh, so Dr. Chi joined our department in 2016. She actually started her um, academic uh, journey at the University of Alberta, uh, as she was. Uh, uh, she's from Edmonton. Uh, and following her PhD, she went on to Harvard, uh, where she spent a few years uh, in uh, at the Harvard Medical School and uh, doing her postdoc. And then she joined, as I mentioned, her department, uh, our department in 2016. And I would say uh, her research program is one that is systematic and meticulous. Uh, she's really interested in uh, her research is on the neurobiology of obesity. And she's really interested in um, determining the neuro circuits, neuro circuits that uh, regulate appetite and body weight. Uh, she employs multiple methods in her lab. She used transgenic mouth mo mouse models, electrophysiology, which is a really elegant technique that I'm sure she's going to explain a bit more about today, some genetic techniques, as well as behavioral testing. Uh, Dr. Chi is also flexible uh, to meet the demands and, and the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. She was also um, uh, able to flip some of her research and actually uh, start studying um, eating behavior in humans. Uh, so she was collaborating with uh, several of our faculty members here uh, in uh, doing a multi-wave survey uh, data. She's highly collaborative. Um, she's got uh, an excellent group of trainees working in her lab. She's very much um, adored uh, by uh, the graduate students in her lab as well as several undergraduate students and her colleagues. In addition to her excellent research program, she's a fantastic teacher, which is why you're going to, I'm sure, have a treat today. Uh, it does take a lot of skill to translate science to the general public. So this is something that um, Dr. Chi is, is very adept. Uh, she's also committed to outreach. Uh, a few years ago, she started the Chi Lab Brain Freeze, uh, which is a run-walk event that raises funds uh, for charitable organizations. Uh, she's raised funds uh, for children at risk, which is uh, provides su supports to families with children with autism. And also uh, she did a virtual walk run last year with um, raising money for the Minnewashan Lodge, which is an organization that provides shelter and support to Indigenous women who are victims of domestic violence. I also asked Melissa, what's her favorite snack? Um, and she replied to me today uh, that she likes salty snacks. So um, I think some no, of us- No, that's like, not what I said. I know? said, <laughs> I like all- like All snacks, <laughs> true, all snacks. So salty, <laughs> almonds, cashews, cheese, ketchup flavored mini rice cakes. Like uh, that's verging on healthy. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a big fan of ketchup chips, uh, full stop. And then also, sorry, I should say sweet snacks. Yes. So wafers with his nut filling or chocolate in any form. So with that uh, tasty uh, uh, image in your brain, uh, without further ado, over to you, Dr. Chi. Thank you so much, Kim. <laughs> I'm really excited to speak at the Science Cafe, and I truly wish that we could actually gather at a cafe to have this conversation. And if we were at a cafe, you would probably find me, ironically enough, sipping probably a sweetened beverage while professing the dangers of sugar. And I think this conflict highlights the complex relationship that we have with food. Um, because despite the awareness that we should avoid unhealthy foods, we don't or we can't. And this is in part because um, it's a multifaceted role of the brain in eating behavior. It suggests that the brain's control of eating behavior has many variables at play. So eating behavior is governed not only by hunger, but also by cognitive or psychosocial factors. And we are driven to seek food when we are hungry, and that's what we know about. But we also know that we can eat when we're not hungry, and especially also when we're full. And if you may recall, we may have experienced over Thanksgiving eating um, to the point that we're very full. And then when the dessert comes around, we still manage to get the last piece of pie in there. It just wiggles its way down, right? And especially when it comes to dessert or sweets, 
it's sometimes very hard to just say no. And in large part, our decision making or is affecting our choices that we make around food and our surroundings also play a significant role. So the sight of the buffet table kind of attracts your attention. If it's a dessert buffet, that attracts even more attention or the smell of warm chocolate chip cookies fresh out of the oven. And we might feel we might be feeling just fine, not even hungry, and that would be tempting us to go seek for food. So um, it's important to remember also that how we're feeling in the moment can also impact our food choices. And I'm going to put up this quote that says, stressed is desserts spelled backwards. And I think that this quote bears a lot of truth um, because our mood and our emotions do affect our appetite and the relationship between stress and food is omnipresent. And many individuals, um, when feeling stressed, do tend to seek comfort foods. Um, if you think of a picture of maybe yourself or myself <laughs> with a, you know, a tub of ice cream when you're having a rough day, um, so we, we turn to food as a coping strategy um, in times of stress. So we are right now living in a pandemic, which is a highly stressful time. And we might have many worries. We are anxious. We are worried about our loved ones, our children. We are uncomfortable, basically. Um, and we're often stuck indoors, many of us working from home. And there were many early reports that have indicated that um, about one in four or five adults reported gaining up to 10 pounds in body weight. So it suggested that, okay, what might be underlying this um, body weight gain? Could it be food intake or is it just activity levels? And early reports coming out of Europe, um, as they had experienced the pandemic a little bit sooner than we did here in Canada, that during the lockdown period, there were higher reports of consuming comfort foods. Although there was one report in a Mediterranean study where participants living at home now or working from home now were eating uh, a little bit healthier because they were preparing their own meals. Um, and that healthier eating was due to a reduction of fast foods. But really the vast majority of studies coming out of Europe during that time was showing a high correlation between working from home and being confined in their houses and eating unhealthily. So we were interested in understanding whether or not this would be true in participants living in Canada or in the United States. So we thought this was a really ripe environment for us to understand the relationship between stress and how we cope with stress, perhaps by eating, and what might be some of the COVID-related factors that contributed to the shifts in food choice. So this study is called The Piece of Cake, and it was coordinated by a really talented undergraduate summer student, Nikita, and our collaborators, Dr. Ha um, Jaime Anisman and Dr. Kim Matheson, also from our Department of Neuroscience. And in this survey, we queried um, participant demographics. Um, it's a research, uh, research questionnaire, so a collection of scales that asked about their participant characteristics, how their COVID-19 experiences were. We also asked about their food intake over the week period, and we queried how they were feeling through their mood. Um, we appraised their stress or how they were appraising their stress and their coping strategies that they were using. So in this study, we were able to recruit almost 700 participants and the majority of our participants were female and young, so under the age of uh, about 40. And the vast majority had at least some post-secondary education. But none of these demographic factors had contributed to the outcomes that we saw in eating that I'm going to tell you about. So next we looked at COVID-19 experiences now, the data that we collected was between May and June of 2020. And despite being in the first wave of the pandemic, we did not actually obtain many um, participants that reported that they were infected by COVID or that they had known someone who was diagnosed. And the vast majority of people were um, had experienced some kind of a stay-at-home order, so 90%, and neither being infected or just staying at home was one of the main factors, but we did see that 40% of participants had experienced a change in their employment status. So these individuals may have worked more or worked reduced hours, or they could have been laid off. And we saw that those who are more likely to be laid off or work reduced hours tended to be younger or lower income participants. So the employment change was a really significant factor within this COVID era, um, area and 
we saw that employment change required more coping resources. So coping strategies may be avoidant, so that means you're avoiding the problem, or it could be coping by dealing with your emotions, so that's emotion-focused coping, and problem-focused, so you're tackling the problem by problem-solving. And we found that individuals, how their individuals um, appraises their situation. So if they appraise their situation to be stressful, this is really related to coping strategies that are avoidant or emotion focused. Meanwhile, if an individual appraised the situation to be controllable, then they're more likely to execute problem focused coping strategies. So interestingly, in our mediation models, we showed that employment change, um, this appraisal of stressfulness had mediated the relationships we saw between employment change and these coping strategies. Whereas, uh, uh, so meaning that avoidant coping strategies and emotion focused coping strategies were not as adequate as the problem focused ones. So predictably, experiencing some kind of employment change was also related to our mood, so how they were feeling. And in particular, being laid off was most associated with more negative mood and less positive mood, which was, um, and of course, coping strategies now with positive mood, that was related to problem-focused coping strategies, whereas when you experience negative mood, that's related to emotion-focused or avoidant coping strategies. Now, interestingly, when we talk about food, positive mood was also associated with healthy snacks. So for example, fruits or vegetables, and negative food was, or sorry, negative mood was associated with more comfort foods. So in this category, we included um, salty snacks or sweet snacks. And based on these correlational analyses, we see associations between mood states and coping on food choice. So poor coping strategies and worsened mood were associated with poor food choice. And so we wanted to determine what might be underlying the effects on food and how mood and food could be related. So again, we saw that negative mood had predicted the intake of sweet and salty snacks, but not of wholesome snacks, so like fruits and vegetables and wholesome snacks was predicted by positive mood. So negative mood was also related to coping by eating, so or eating to cope. And in fact, um, higher your negative mood scores, you're more likely to be coping by eating, whereas positive mood was related to lower coping by eating. And we saw that um, eating to cope actually mediates the relationship between negative mood and comfort food snacking, but not of positive mood and wholesome foods. So in this short study, we saw that um, employment change and shifting to working from home were significant COVID-related factors that were stressful and led to worsened mood outcomes, especially when we were coping with the stressful situations with inadequate strategies that were emotion-focused or just avoiding the problem. And consequently, we found that coping by eating would mediate how we're feeling this worsened mood with unhealthy snacking. So in addition to eating, we are now also analyzing the role of physical activity as a counterpart to healthy eating, or sorry, healthy living. And we rolled out follow-up surveys with our participants to assess physical activity levels six months um, into the pandemic period. And we found that physical activity levels decreased over time. So importantly, this decrease um, in physical activity was related to how we appraise our stress and um, related to worsened mood. So it, if appraising the stress to be threatening or uncontrollable, this um, mediated that relationship between lower physical activity and worsened mood. And so you could imagine how this could have significant downstream consequences for unhealthy snacking as well. And we are planning prospective studies to understand whether these trends would reverse as restrictions are loosened or as our communities begin to recover from the pandemic. So what is it about this unhealthy snacking um, that is detrimental to our overall well-being? And in the study, we did look at salty and sweet snacks, but one significant area of focus in my lab is to understand the role of sugars within our diet. So our current focus is on sugar, specifically added sugars to our diet. So these could be sweeteners or preservatives. And I dare say you already know that um, eating, consuming a sugar or a diet that's high in sugar is not a healthy food habit, but it is very difficult to curb our sugar intake. 
you know, we do need to eat sugars because it's an essential energy source. Um, but then we have this associated craving. So the work that I will show you will offer a new perspective on how sugar, specifically the sugar fructose, may produce maladaptations at brain cells that could then lead to overeating. And then in closing, I thought this would be a good audience where we could explore together some strategies to improve our, uh, our food habits. So let's talk about these sugars. So what you see on the screen here is the number 25, and it's we should, it bears significance for several professions. As a mathematician, this would be a square number. An accountant would think, oh, these are 25 cents and a quarter. Um, this is also to happen to be the number of bones in your chest. But to a dietitian and a nutritionist, and for, for us today to remember, this is how many grams of added sugar we can safely consume in one day. That's 25 grams of sugar. So I put a little picture here because I cannot demonstrate to you here. Um, this is in this little yogurt container is 25 grams of sugar. And I put a little um, coffee mug behind it just to give you the relative scale. So that does look like a lot of sugar to me, or maybe you're thinking that's not a lot of sugar. So I, I thought I would describe a sample meal plan. It may or may not be my sample meal plan. Um, so I included a breakfast, a snack, a lunch, a snack, <laughs> we like snacks, a dinner, and also a dessert because I often have dessert. <laughs> so let's say we have maple instant oatmeal, and then we grab an egg and have a little bit of an orange juice. And then for a snack, you can have a little fat fruit yogurt. And for lunch, you can have a sandwich with cheese and honey ham or spinach. And then a snack, you might splurge on a fancy smoothie, like a veggie vanilla almond milk smoothie. It does sound healthy. And then for dinner, you can have some kind of a leafy salad with light dressing. Um, a quick dinner usually is like pasta with pasta sauce and then three Oreo cookies. Mm -hmm. And what I've indicated here in asterisks is the food items that have added sugar to it. And I've just tallied the amount of added sugar that are in these asterisk ingredients, and that adds up to about 91 grams. That's nearly four times the recommended amount of added sugar in the daily diet. And I, I think this is a fairly reasonable diet, um, or not diet, just a meal for the day. And that already adds up to 91 grams. So these added sugars are in the foods that we add, um, the ingredients that we use, and they're just kind of hidden in there. I mean, who knew that pasta sauce would have eight grams of added sugar, right? So what is it about sugar that is bad for us? So sugar, the science name for that is sucrose, but that's just the same um, table white sugar, okay? And white sugar is comprised of two simple um, sugar molecules called glucose and fructose. So when we eat sugar, it will get broken down and absorbed in our body as glucose and fructose. And glucose is an energy source for our body, and it certainly is for the brain. And in fact, it also functions as a satiety signal. So what that means is when our brain sees glucose, it actually tells the brain that, oh, you're full now and you can stop eating. So when the brain perceives glucose, it's going to um, tell it to curb food intake. But we don't see that with fructose. And in fact, fructose does the opposite thing. So if the brain sees fructose, that can actually stimulate feeding. And we are particularly interested in understanding how fructose could be leading to uh, metabolic disorders. So the problem also with fructose is that there is an increased prevalence of fructose in our diet. So in this quite popular chart, you'll see a, this um, dark brown on my screen. Maybe it looks as black, but the dark, dark brown um, plotted circles is tracking the amount of fructose that is in the diet um, over a period of several decades. And what's particularly noteworthy about the, this curve is that the rise in the consumption of fructose is preceding the rise in obesity rates shown in orange. Okay. So it's thought that the um, fructose consumption could be one of the factors that's contributing to the rise of the ob obesity epidemic. So where is fructose coming from? So fructose is actually found in natural and nutritious foods. The good stuff, right, um, are really rich sources of fructose, especially um, nectar-type fruits like mangoes or papayas. 
really rich sources of fructose and also honey. Honey is a really rich source of fructose, honey or nectars. But we don't tend to usually overeat this stuff, but we do tend to overeat the really good stuff, right? The stuff we like, the candies, the cookies, cupcakes, and I'm noticing that they all start with the letter C, chocolate, ice cream, and Coca-Cola. And fructose is disguised in the form of added sugars that are added to these sweeteners in processed food or pastries. And it might be really surprising how pervasive um, added sugars can be in our diet, not just in these pictures, because these pictures are clearly obviously sugary, but as I showed you in a sample meal plan, um, could be hidden in you know day-to-day -day ingredients that we used. So my PhD student, Michaela Payan, um, spearheaded the following experiments to assess the metabolic effects of fructose consumption or fructose intake. So to answer this question, we fed animals a regular chow diet just like a hamster chow, um, and then a 60% fructose diet, so a high fructose diet. And we also included a high glucose diet, so we could check to see if any effects that we see would be specific only to fructose, or if the effects would be generic to just eating any kind of high sugar diet. So remember, glucose is the other um, sugar counterpart to fructose. All right, so let's dive into the results. So first of all, I'm gonna show you a comparison between the chow fed animals with the high glucose fed animal in orange. And we're showing you here the body weight curve of the animal over time. And on this curve, we're looking at the amount of body fat the animal has. So of the chow in the black, and then orange is the glucose animals, glucose fed animals. So we don't see many differences in the body weight of the chow fed or the glucose fed animal and also not a significant difference in their body fat. So what happened to the fructose-fed animals? So in green, because the, the green, uh, the fructose diet that we give to the animals is actually colored green, so we keep the, um, <laughs> we keep our data the same color so we're not confused. So we see that with the fructose-fed animals, there is an increase in body weight, and there is a much larger increase in their body fat composition. So in science, um, we signify really important data with a really small symbol, this asterisk or the star. It's kind of ironic that we label important information with a small symbol, but that is the convention of science. So when you see this small star, you'll see that that is a significant result. So we see that the fructose-fed animals have a much higher body fat change than the chow-fed animals over time. So next, we wanted to assess um, how much the animals were eating, so their food intake, and their activity levels, so their ambulations, but it's just a science way of saying the steps. So just as you would have worn like a, like a step tracker, like a Fitbit, to track the number of steps that you take when you go for a walk, we can also determine how many steps, steps a mouse is taking um, in a, for a 24-hour period. So we just call that ambulations or steps. And then the third graph I'm showing is the blood glucose levels. So blood glucose is obviously really related to um, having sugars in your bloodstream. So again, the same convention, black animals, and I'm going to show you next what happens in the fructose-fed animal. So now with the fructose-fed animal, oops, my internet is telling me that it's unstable. Pardon me. Um, so with the fructose-fed animal, we see that they're eating more calories than the chow-fed animals. So they're eating more. So what happened to the number of steps that they took? It's lower. So the green bar, so the fructose-fed animals are moving less and eating more, not a good combination. And they have hyperglycemia, so they have high blood sugar. Okay. So this such shows that fructose feeding would promote this metabolic syndrome. Okay. Okay, so what about the brain? How does fructose feeding would impact the brain connections? Okay, and this is a question that Michaela had asked. But before I dive into that, I wanted to maybe take a historical um, perspective and show you some of the historical data that led to us knowing that the brain is an important part of controlling feeding behavior. And these experiments actually began in the um, earliest in the uh, 19... Yeah, 1940s, the early 40s, and then continued into the early 50s. So over this 10-year um, span, these, these were the first studies that showed the importance of the brain in feeding behavior. So 
what these researchers were doing is they could produce lesions in particular areas of the brain. And if they lesion an area called the ventromedial hypothalamus, you can see, you know, the techniques are a little bit older back in the day. So the lesions were much larger. Of course, our techniques now are a little bit more refined, but really the premise is that by, um, lesioning certain areas of the brain, they, were, they showed that practically 100% of their rats became obese. But if they lesion a different part of the brain, so the lateral part, lateral meaning the outside parts of this region called the hypothalamus, um, they saw that it produced 100% failure to eat. So these kinds of experiments are showing that, okay, clearly the brain plays a really important role in regulating food intake because the loss could either, there could be either a loss of function or a gain of function um, by manipulating these cells. But of course, these regions are really large and overly simplistic because this region encompasses, and particularly this region, the hypothalamus, encompasses a lot of diverse and heterogeneous cell types that all have a very particular role in protecting energy balance. So energy balance is really an equation between how much energy you're consuming and then how much energy you're expending. Now, in terms of energy expenditure, there is really four main ways that we expend energy. 60 or 70% comes from our basal metabolic rate, so our basal metabolism, and we really cannot manipulate our basal metabolism very much over our lifespan. And then 20 or 30% comes from exercise, which is like running, jogging, walking, riding your bike, you know, activity, right, physical activity, or non-exercise thermogenesis, which is like, um, if I'm fidgeting, I tend to be a fidgety person, or if I'm moving my arms a lot, um, or if you're sitting down listening to me speak, you might be shaking your leg, that's non-exercise thermogenesis. And then the last part is called the thermic effect of food, that's about 10%. It's kind of my favorite part, it's when um, you burn energy by eating food, so... <laughs> always a good one but really the the one component that we can actively change and do a lot about is the exercise and that only comprises about 20 percent right and the other side of the equation is um, how do we gain energy and there's only one way that's eating food intake and the hypothalamus this hypothalamus region it can control both sides of the equation but really we can really manipulate is the the food intake aspect so that's why we, you know, focus on the hypothalamus and we think about these cells. And with regards to food intake, though, there's many different cell types within the brain that will um, protect food intake. And the one cell type that I'm going to talk to you about is the neuropeptide Y cell. Okay, And we call it NPY as an abbreviation, so the NPY cell. So what's so special about the NPY or the neuropeptide Y cell? Well, first of all, we know that when you activate, when you stimulate the NPY cell, it can give the message to the brain to go, or to the mouse to go and seek food. So the mouse can be fully satiated and not hungry, but when that neuron, the NPY neurons are stimulated, it will go and seek food. And we also know that a hungry mouse, so for example, if we um, food restrict or fast the animal, um, we know that the NPY neurons get a lot of electrical activity. So this electrical activity will stimulate their overall activity, and that overall stimulation will um, tell the, an animal to go and seek food. So what I'm showing you on the screen is an image for, through mic our microscope where we're labeling the NPY neurons with the green fluorescence. It just looks like white on my screen so that we can see them with the naked eye. And we can see these, if you zoom, using a high magnification lens, we can go in closer and identify a single neuropeptide Y cell. And we can approach this cell with a glass pipette so we can listen in to the electrical activity of this NPY neuron, all right? Okay, so I'm going to show you next what that electrical activity would look like. So that sample, um, this is a sample trace of an electrical activity that you could record from an NPY neuron. So it looks like these little downward blips. And then we measure the frequency of these downward events. So we call this the activity frequency. And so what I show you here in this bar is the activity frequency at the NPY neuron from a chow-fed animal. 
Okay, so just to show you that, um, remember I mentioned that in the hungry mouse, the MPY neuron would get a lot of electrical activity and a lot of this electrical activity can then lead to the mouse seeking food. So we definitely detect that. So if we fast the animal or food restrict the animal, we get a lot of more electrical activity, right? You can see that there's a lot more events here compared to when they're satiated and just eating the chow. And we represent that in this bar. So a fasted animal has significantly more electrical activity at these MPY neurons. So what happens when the mouse is eating fructose diet? So a satiated mouse eating a fructose diet has nearly the same amount of electrical activity as a mouse that's fasted, right? So here's a sample trace of that electrical activity from the mouse that's eating the fructose diet, and it's very busy. It's getting a lot of activity. So what might this mean, right? I just told you that higher electrical activity is kind of when the mouse is in the hungry state to seek food. And we see that same thing when the mouse is eating the fructose diet, and we don't see that with the other sugar, the glucose. Right? So it's really specific to the fructose. So this is showing that the brain state in the fructose-fed mouse is saying hunger. So the mouse that's eating this fructose diet is replicating the state of a hunger state. Right? So that's why we say sugar in the hungry mouse. Okay? And so interestingly, though, it suggests also that, you know, that our brain is really malleable and adaptable to our environment, the environment in this case being the diet. right? So when you give the animal a fructose diet, it will increase its activity. You restrict food, it can increase its activity. So can we actually capitalize on this ability for it to change? Or is it, are we a lost cause? Once we have the sugar, are we, are we done? Can we actually rescue that phenotype? So we're looking here to see if, okay, so we've taken the mouse that eats fruit, that we've given it fructose. Now, if we remove fructose, could we capitalize on that adaptability and revert the electrical changes that we see? Okay, so we then compare the activity to our chow animals, which is our control. And then here's what we observe with the fructose-fed animals that have then be removed from fructose and placed back on a regular chow. And it can actually reduce their feeding. So it tells us that the environment is, the neural environment, the cell environment at the MPY cells is incredibly adaptable and can change with um, sudden changes in our diet. So um, at this point, um, a master student, Aditi Sanka, joined the lab and she asked the question of, okay, so the neurons are really adaptable. You've just told me that if I remove the, the fructose diet and we put it back on chow, we can kind of rescue the cells. But what if fructose is reintroduced? You know, kind of like when we, um, you know, go on a vacation and we have lots of sugary things and we come back and we kind of go on a cleanse because we've been bad. And then eventually cravings take over and we just, we lose it and we go for it again. We, you know, it's kind of like yo-yo dieting, right? So Aditi was thinking, okay, well, what would happen to, can we study that in a mouse? And this is, you know, an ongoing. So this is what I'm going to show you. So we can put the animals in a fructose diet. They eat more of calories. We give them a cleanse. We put them back on the chow. And then we reintroduce them to the fructose diet. And what's notable is, so here's the group where we gave them fructose, gave them a cleanse, put them back on fructose. And then when we compare it to animals that were just eating fructose for the whole time, okay, and you see there that they actually eat more than if they if an animal during that third week was remaining on that fructose diet. So Aditi is now interested in looking at whether or not there would be a compensatory change also at those MPY neurons that might be related to this overconsumption in the reintroduction to the fructose diet. Right. So I bring this picture up again because I think to me, it, it, um, you know, it kind of speaks to me when I, you know, I, I do bad things over Christmas, especially over Christmas. You have all those cakes and cookies around and it's really hard to say no. And then I come back and it's my January cleanse. And then, you know, by definitely by Valentine's Day, it's like, oh, I'm back on sugar again. Right. So we, we kind of really relate to that. So what can we do? Um, I don't want to leave this cafe with this really negative, like, don't do this because it's bad for you. And I think that's um, prohibitive to um, 
adopting healthier practices. So I thought we would discuss some strategies that we could use for better food choices. So I think one thing is minimizing fructose exposure in children, because I've just said that um, our brains are very adaptable and children's brain are even more so adaptable than adult brains. So minimizing their exposure to fructose could be protective, I think. And secondly, beware of yo-yo dieting, right? The cyclical effects, because that, that buildup of the craving, I think, is kind of what does us over later. And the third and fourth is um, one, try to, if possible, eat your calories rather than drinking your calories. So if you want to have a banana, you know, eat the banana rather than putting it into the banana milkshake. Because remember about the thermic effect of food, that your your energy, your your body actually will burn energy when it to digest the food, right? So eating your calories can also be helpful. And lastly, something that we can definitely do something about is reading the food labels. So why is that important? It's because added sugar is hidden in plain sight and it can have many names. So we might be familiar with high fructose corn syrup. And this is the phrase that they use in the United States. In Canada, this is called glucose fructose. And in Europe, it's called isoglucose. Okay. And these are just some other names of various sugars that you might see in your food labels, in the food ingredients. And I wanted to point out, you know, some of them sound healthy, you know, like agave nectar. It's actually purported to be like a health food because it's nectar and it sounds kind of fancy, but ne agave nectar is 80 to 85% fructose. Kind of scary. <laughs> okay, so I think keep that in mind. And then another strategy is, um, I think, to actually not be prohibitive, not be overly restrictive, but rather be intentional about when we include added sugar in our diet. So I'm going to just bring back this um, sample meal, our daily meal intake, and how what can we do with this sample meal? So maybe we could try this instead. Instead, So if we're going to have that instant oatmeal, we can have regular oatmeal and add brown sugar. Or for a snack, we can have a plain Greek yogurt, lots of protein, and then drizzle a half teaspoon of honey to it. Okay, so you're asking me, so, well, you just told me that we shouldn't be having added sugar, so why am I adding sugar to simple breakfast foods? Well, th I think this is where um, I kind of go, well, we need to balance between having an exciting life, because I think sugar does make life exciting, it makes food taste good, but not be overly restrictive, right? If you're overly restrictive, this is not fun. <laughs> What's the point when it's not fun? So if we can be intentional about when we choose to have added sugar, we are in better control over um, how much sugar we are able to consume. And another strategy is replace, you know, being aware that some of these processed foods like pre-prepared pre -prepared dressings or sauces have a lot of added sugars in it. And if we could reduce that and supplement the flavor that we miss from processed food with herbs, for example, um, that could also be exciting. So in closing, I would like to just recap what we talked about. And first is to be aware of our moods um, and our physical activity could impact also our mood because mood can really predict our unhealthy eating. So our awareness of how we're feeling might maybe remind us that, oh, I'm feeling not very well. So I really want to have chocolate right now. But if we're consciously aware of that, maybe it might help us choose not to have the chocolate. And then the other thing is keep in mind this number, 25 grams of added sugar, and beware the F word, fructose. And lastly, um, it's because fructose will lead to overeating. And finally, what can you do about it? I think we can read food labels and be aware of where sugars might be appearing in these food ingredients. So um, I want to thank the Faculty of Science for hosting the Science Cafe and also for giving me the opportunity to speak. I was really excited to receive this invitation and I hope that you've enjoyed hearing about sugars. I'm also really grateful to our funding sources, um, the Carlton University Research Office for funding our COVID study and CIHR for funding our fructose study and also to the Discovery Center and Teaching and Learning Services at Carleton for funding um, the students' internships that many of my students have received um, and other funding agencies who have provided internships and scholarships for my team. I wanted to highlight Nikita for spearheading the COVID study, Piece of Cake, Michaela, my PhD student, Aditi, and Yasmina now for working on the Fructose Project. 
And in green, you can see here some of the other students made that have been involved in their FERCSO study. And I'm eternally grateful to a really energetic um, and enthusiastic team <laughs> for putting up with all my bad jokes. And since I just told you that um, being in a positive mood is protective maybe against unhealthy snacking, I thought I would leave you with a lasting image. So thank you very much. Amazing. Wow, that was really wonderful. Uh, I, 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 I saw your paper when it came out um, and, and read it, but it's, it's always wonderful to see it put into the public this way. And I really love that you, you, you then juxtaposed your, the neurobiology uh, and the, well, the neuroscience research uh, alongside with the human research to, to, to have that translational feel. So there are some questions in the chat and uh, we'll get started with some of those. Um, I do also want to mention that in my office, Melissa knows this, I always have a bowl of, of chocolates mm, yes. um, to lure in uh, as faculty and students are walking by in a pre-COVID era uh, so that they could have a chat. So chocolate, chocolate, and it, you can see it, it's the good dark chocolate kind, right? So yes, yes. <laughs> and I am feeling stressed now because I just gave these presentations, so I may need that. <laughs> you may need to walk down. Um, so the first question is actually from an, an anonymous attendee and one that is near and dear to my heart because anonymous attendee, you don't know that I study addiction. So the question is, is it possible to be addicted to sugar? So Melissa, I'm curious to know what you think. Mm -hmm. There's actually this whole field of research that tries to understand whether or not there's food addiction or sugar addiction. So one of the things that we know about sugar is that it can actually also activate the regions of the brain that we know to be involved in addiction um, pathways. Um, for example, there's a brain region called the nucleus accumbens that can be activated by uh, addictive pathways. Um, the names of the brain regions does, doesn't really matter. The point is that it, it could produce similar responses to um, substance use um, compounds. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Oh, yeah. And if, if you are a student, I do teach, teach a course called The Neural Basis of Addiction. And uh, I teach uh, on, on eating and how binge eating disorder can be conceived of as uh, it's very akin to substance use disorder. So I would say, yes, there is definitely some elements there that are um, in very congruous with what we see with substances like um, alcohol. Uh, Matthew is asking, do you think added fructose causes enough societal harm that we should consider regulations around them? So for example, limits in processed foods, warning labels, etc. Great That's a really astute question. Um, a few years back when um, Prime Minister Trudeau first came into office, there was actually a health mandate to restrict or minimize the advertising for um, really high sugary foods. Um, I think breakfast cereal is particularly one of those. I, I love chocolate. <laughs> I shouldn't say this, but I really like chocolate chocolate ball cereals. Why? <laughs> it's like brightly colored and it's really tasty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> My favorite brand is Nesquik. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think there is now the awareness. Um, and actually really what I hope that my research can contribute to is policy changes that would restrict the advertisements of these sorts of things and limit the use of fructose in processed foods, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's not to say we can't use sugar, but to avoid using free fructose mm -hmm. would be already an added benefit. So indeed, absolutely. Yeah, public education and awareness too is is, is crucial. And, and it's interesting that the like different countries have different regulations about the amounts of sugars that can in and the added uh, elements. And, and it's interesting you mentioned cereal because I know there are some cereals you cannot get in Canada, uh, or that you get in Canada, and they have very they have different formulations because of our different um, food. I guess this is something that Canadian Food Inspection Agency and, yeah. and, and, and there's a program in, at Carleton called Food Science, which deals with this yeah. kind of stuff as well. And also from a global health perspective, I believe I've seen statistics where countries that use more fructose in their foods have higher rates of diabetes and obesity oh, than countries that do not. Um, I'm not a global health yeah. uh, statistician, but that kind of data is actually out there. So there is you know, yeah, it's a compelling it's thing to look at. If that's a simple thing that we could do, um, we, sh we should. Um, yeah, so it's about the science informing the policy, right? Which is yeah. really vital. Uh, so Tim is wondering, hi, Dr. Chi, thank you for this. The data is compelling on sugars. I'm curious if you'll be conducting similar studies on sugar alternatives 
such as sucralose. I'm all for reducing sugars in diet, but it seems these sugar alternatives are creating a false sense of security. And yeah, this this was the thing um, several years ago with those like the fake sugars, right? Uh, now we know, you know, sugar twin and all that had different effects, right? Yeah, that's right. Oh, so, so yeah, these um, sugar substitutes, they kind of trick the brain to think that it has sugar, but it hasn't. So in a way it can actually make you want to eat more, right? Because your brain is thinking, oh, there's something sweet, but I'm not getting the satiety response. Remember when your yeah, brain- those NPY. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 There's no satiety signal. So it's still seeking that satiety signal. So it's not quenching the hunger. Um, maybe, way. yeah, yes. That, this is a significant area of study. Yeah. Do you know if that that's what they found in like, cause I always wondered that, that they that's were saying, right. yeah, it is that those NPY having the, like aspartame, I think is yeah. the one I can't remember if it was aspartame or sucralose that was more studied. I, one of those two, they were seeing that it could also animals that were given this supplement, this additive um, also had similar adiposity. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. I just totally anecdotally before I got pregnant, I would use sugar twin. And then when I got pregnant, I was like, uh, you know, data is mixed on this. I probably should stop. And I stopped having sugar cravings. Mm. Like it was completely like my, 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 and that could be the pregnancy hormones, but my, my cravings for certain kinds of foods totally changed. Mm -hmm. Um, we've got lots of great comments in the chat. Chris Guth is saying great science cafe. Thank you. OD science. Uh, Miss Delin is saying, thank you so much. Very insightful on yo-yo dieting. I'll think twice about the Pepsi at supper tonight. Ahmed's wondering, do fruits have the same effect on the brain as fructose since fruits have a lot of fructose? Great question. I'm wondering that as well. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so I often get asked like, you know, why would nature build this thing called fructose and be bad for us? Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have to kind of think more evolutionarily. Um, when food was scarce, when, if you think more caveman days, right? When you go and see this fruit, it's like, you have to remember where that tree is, mm -hmm. right? It's like a <laughs> important thing to make you remember there's okay. a significant food source here. Yeah. In today's world, we don't, we just have to go to the fridge or the pantry. We don't know to remember where it is. It's just 10 steps away, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a disconnect with between how we're living in today's world. But the other thing about fruits though, is that there's a lot of fiber that are in fruits that um, can stabilize your blood sugar over time. So it can quench the hunger and maybe sustain your energy sources a little bit longer. Right, so it's about the the combination of what, what that fruit does in, right? Whether it's in a like a pop versus a fruit probably has exactly. a really different impact. If it's a pop, it, there's no digestion. It's like yeah. right there, you get the hit right away. Sugar high, um, yeah. And also the different types of fructoses that are being used in foods like, um, the high fructose corn syrup isn't the same as just sugar. It's like free fructose. Yeah. There's yeah. no breakdown involved. It's just free floating fructose. And that gets processed quite differently. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, I, it matches with one of the questions in the chat, which I think is one of our food science profs, Apollo, he's saying very interesting talk. Is there any food ingredient that can counter the effect of fructose? So maybe oh. could it be the fiber, right? Could yeah. It I mean, the fiber is a little, it just sustains your blood sugar levels. And, and when you eat the fiber, you kind of feel full, right? Um, so you're you're less likely to have the second chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. So there's an element to it, but that's an interesting thought actually to counter the effect of fructose. There we go. And then, so Shirley's wondering, thanks for your presentation and your work. What about making products made with glucose instead of fructose? Mm. So the thing about fructose that makes it so appealing, and I, I apologize, I didn't mention this, is that it tastes really sweet. So fructose is the sweetest of the simple sugars and glucose is kind of bland. It's like flour. It's sorry. It has no, it doesn't have a sweet, mm. has, doesn't have as much of a sweet taste. So making products with glucose, is kind of like pasta. Um, it's more starchy. Simple starch. Yeah. Right. So it wouldn't and have sucrose, to Sucrose, which is a combination of glucose and fructose is like midway, midway sweet. So if you think table sugar is sweet, fructose is even sweeter than that. Huh. Um, which makes it, you know, that's why the manufacturing agents industry like could capitalize on that right it's yeah. cheaper to manufacture fructose and it's sweeter 
<laughs> it's like a win-win for that. Yeah, industry. I have this book in my office, which is written by, he's the former oh, yeah. head, uh, scientific director of the FDA. Yeah. And, and he talks about how um, like the food industry does manipulate how, how our brain responds to various uh, like things like sugars, uh, fructose and sucrose. It's a fascinating book. Um, so another anonymous attendee is wondering, will excess sugar affect memory or lead to Alzheimer's? How much is too much? Mm, that's an interesting question. So um, the effect of, sh of fructose isn't only, uh, oh, I, I suppose, did you say sugar or fructose? Sugar. Or I guess I can open the, yeah. the question. That's okay. No, no. Did you say sugar or fructose? I Sugar. Didn't. In sugar. Excess in sugar. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'm not so familiar with that literature, but what I do know is that the hypothalamus and feeding is not the only roles that fructose can impact. Um, fructose can also impact cognitive processes that are related to learning and memory, um, and it can also create inflammatory conditions. And if that inflammatory condition is related to dementias or Alzheimer's disease, then it could have that indirect effect. So. Yeah, I think that's exactly. your question a little bit indirectly, but yeah, it, you know, feeding and food intake is not the only effect of fructose. It could have some neurotoxicity overall. Yeah, well, we know that those kinds of diets, like you said, can be have in, higher inflammation, which is one of the pathways to the development of dementias because it leads to uh, changes in vasculature in the brain. Similarly, Sandra's wondering, has there been any correlation between fructose intake and risk of the development of cancers? Mm, yes, and my colleague, Dr. Jaime Anisman, is, is, I think, writing a book on that. Mm, <laughs> so yes, he is. Yeah, the short That's story for, is... For one yeah. of Jaime's books. Yeah, he's all yeah, about, absolutely. he's writing a lot about um, cancer and, and inflammatory right. disease. Yeah. And as uh, Dr. Chi mentioned, that's one of our collaborators. So stay tuned for uh, uh, Jaime's books, which are very good. Uh, oh, Jacun, Jacun is wondering, since fructose and glucose are sweet, how can we tell the difference without reading labels? Or can you? If fructose, ah... Uh, I guess you can't. <laughs> yeah. You can't tell unless you see the word. It's just like a white, white crystalline structure. Yeah, it looks like cocaine. Uh, anonymous attendee is wondering. I get often get hungry later on at night. It's hard not to go for the highly processed foods. And this is as we see this also. I, I've seen data on folks that work shift work very similarly. They get out of sync with their natural circadian rhythms, and they often yeah. seek highly processed foods. Sounds like it's better to go for fruit, but is that good to eat later at night or will that contribute to weight gain? Okay, that's also a really good question. Um, now we're kind of talking about circadian rhythm also. Um, we have a natural circadian rhythm and eating late at night is just, uh, yeah, it, it's not particularly good. Um, I think that if you were feeling a little peckish at, in the evening, consider milk. Um, milk has its own natural sugars. That doesn't count, by the way, milk sugars that don't count because it's not an added, unless you have having chocolate milk, that's different. That is an added sugar, but just regular white milk um, might be a good alternative. Um, in the late, when at late at night, um, our secretion of insulin is a little bit different than the secret, the amount of insulin that's secreted during the daytime. So we're not able to secrete as much insulin late at night. Um, and that over time it can accrue, right? So yeah, so that, that that's kind of why late at night eating is not as, it's not recommended. Yeah. But yes, I, I also sometimes get the late at night open but the if, fridge. But if you're in the habit of eating something late at night, probably what's worse is that you've deprived yourself initially. Just switch to something that is more like um, also saying lower fructose or something that's more in the healthier or milk and then slowly wean, wean yourself off of that I would say. Yeah so. that's a really good suggestion. Yeah. yeah. Um, Lewis is wondering maple syrup is so addictive <laughs> more so than brown sugar and honey in my opinion. Uh, is this because it's primary sucrose or is it because it's just so yummy? <laughs> maple syrup? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think well uh oh your internet went out. No. possibly why the addictive properties of these sugars oh. or was the question asking about a, a maple yeah. syrup relative to the other sugars or yeah why is it so 
so much more addictive? Uh, um, is it because it's primary sucrose or just because it's maybe, or it's maybe it's primarily fructose? <laughs> is it is it high fructose maple syrup? Do you know? Yeah, it is a syrup. Yeah. Oh, and it's like boiled concentrated, right? <laughs> it's natural. It's from the tree. <laughs> Okay. It was agave nectar. <laughs> I know. I find that ironic that they they you know food. It's all it's marketed as this health food, right? It's so naughty. It's so not oh. nice. <laughs> I've learned much today. Uh, all right, uh, your, Jorge is wondering the brain activity difference when switched from fructose to chow is de detected after how much time, and if that difference is kept in time or in some way back to normal activity for a chow diet. Could you please repeat that? I cut off for so, a second. Yeah, so you know, you were showing the brain activity when you switched from, I think it was um, Aditi's work, like when you went from a fructose yeah. to chow, right? So you had that, um, uh, yeah. the cleanse, right? Yeah. Uh, how, how long is the difference? In, you know, how long does it take for the brain to sort of switch? Oh, oh, I see. Right. Yeah. Okay, that's another good question, which we're actually doing right now, truly. <laughs> okay. We're trying to figure out what, what the timeline is. So yes, excellent question. All righty. Um, and then last question from Matthew, I recall the fructose interrupts um, uh, the Krebs cycle in a pretty destructive way, but the dietary fiber can act as a mediator in reaction to lessen the impact. Uh, the reference is from a lecture on sugar from a number of years ago. <laughs> probably having a hard time remembering because of sugar induced <laughs> memory, memory loss. So maybe that's from a, uh, I, I, something about uh, maybe biochemistry lecture. Yes. But I don't know yes. that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, it promotes and, this AMPK generation and AMPK is one of the, um, it disrupts the AM, ATP AMP ratio and oh, cool. activates AMPK and AMPK is one of the downstream molecules that is thought to perpetuate these metabolic uh, food intake things. Oh, really interesting. Did not know that. Okay, and this is the absolute last question. And we went, we start a little late, so we can go for one more minute. Tim's wondering, uh, piggybacking about the question timing or timing of eating, is there any scientific data to support having something sweet either with or following a meal as opposed to just having a single sweet treat on its own? For example, grab a chocolate bar late at night versus having it as part of a meal to blunt the glucose spike. Hmm. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Um, but let me just think about that for a second. So eating sweet with something else or eating something sweet on its own. Hmm. I guess eating something sweet with fiber or, you know, just piggybacking off the idea of the fiber, then maybe you might, I mean, totally anecdotal and I, I don't do not know if this is correct, but, you know, maybe that would be part of like, you're going to be eating that thing, right? You, you mm -hmm. already have a finite amount and you're going to be feeling full from the other substances. So would that be minimizing the sugar component? But if you're having just the sugar and feeling peckish, then you have nothing else but the sugar. Mm -hmm. So perhaps doing it with the meal might be a little bit better. And just yeah. thinking, also eating a little bit slower and asking yourself, like, how do I feel right now? Um, eating on your own, sometimes you tend to eat more than when you're eating in a group. True. There's all those psychological factors and circadian. Factors. I mean, that's very, very, like I've heard dietary research is some of the hardest too, because there's so many variables. So, yeah. It's so difficult it's to control all the variables. That's for sure. For sure. Although Matthew is suggesting to wrap a chocolate bar in salad. Mm. <laughs> I don't know about that. Anyway, um, obviously this this yielded such a great um, uh, a series of questions and we got lots of wonderful uh, comments in the chat, Melissa, for you to read on your own time. Um, but I thank you everybody for your patience um, uh, in dealing with a bit of the tech hiccups. Thank you, Dr. Chi, for such a wonderful presentation. This was uh, thank the you highlight so much of Thank you for moderating. Yeah, no worries. Uh, thanks everybody for joining in uh, and uh, hope to see you at our next Science Cafe. Uh, Bye. Hey, have a great day, everybody.